when I came back from Jamaica, I had some questions I still wanted to attack um, on malnutrition. I needed a model, and I found it in children with cystic fibrosis. Some 25, 30 years ago, uh, most children dying of cystic fibrosis were technically malnourished. They didn't look like uh, World Vision pictures because the quality of their diet was okay, but the they couldn't get the quantity they needed in. And so I wanted to know, could I reverse it? Was it worth doing? The first volunteer was a 15-year-old boy with a body mass of an 11-year-old, and he was a farmer's son. He wanted muscle like nothing else on earth. He would do anything to get it. And I said, well, what I want to do is feed you through your nose with a tube for a month, but given your cough, that tube will come in and go, will come out and go in at least 200 times during the month. Can you handle that? He said, yes. And he never complained. About halfway through the month, one Sunday, uh, the nurses called and said, Stephen has coughed up his tube again, and we have so many admissions, we can't put it back till 7 o'clock tonight. If you want your protocol followed, you must come and do it yourself. So I said, fine. I drove in. Now, I was engaged in Christian things by this stage. And I'd been to church, and I arrived wearing a suit. It was still traditional at that stage. Now we treat God as though he's a hippie. Um, <laughs> but I got there, and... Stephen was a bright lad. He said, oh, you've been to church? I said, yes, do you go to church? It turned out he was Catholic and I was Protestant and I had been so well indoctrinated in this liberal environment. We never talk about those things. I didn't say anything. I went home, but his amazing mum, who's going to lose three children to cystic fibrosis, um, she said to me the next week, you should have taken the opportunity on Sunday to talk to Stephen about faith. You could do that very well. She had absolutely no evidence for that statement. How she knew? I have to say, it must have been the Holy Spirit in some way. Turns out she was right, but I didn't know that and certainly didn't wish to believe that it was true because that would bring responsibility and I was allergic to that too. Uh, so I didn't do anything. But about four years later, I was called to see him again, Stephen, uh, in the middle of the day and when I got to his room, he was dying, very obviously. Uh, fortunately, the better of the two deaths available. His mum was there, doing it right, just being there. He hadn't said anything for a while, but when I came in, he said, good, I want to see you. Sit down. Uh, so I sat down, and he said, it says in the Bible, if you ask anything in my name, I'll give it to you. I'm 19, and I'm dying, and I don't want to. What do you say? What would you do if someone said that to you? Of course, I wanted to get out of the room as fast as possible, but it wasn't an option. He was a friend by this time. So I had to work my way through the creeds, and of course he believed them all. He believed that God was God, that Jesus was the Son of God, that uh, if you confess your sins, you're forgiven. When you die, you go to heaven. But it wasn't helping. He needed more. And I didn't know what to say, so I was praying too. Lord, what do I say? And then into my head popped Annie Dillard, pilgrim at Tinker's Creek. Turned out it was a footnote. She says, oh yes, God will provide for all your needs, but do read the small print. He decides what your needs are. Not you. God will only give you the answer to your prayers if they are good, as defined by him and not by you. And I already pointed out to Stephen, there were children who were running on that ward who wouldn't have been walking but for his courage by this time. It had become a, a very well-organized standard procedure with a permanent little button. We put probably the first one in. And I said to him, Stephen, I think God is saying something like this to you. Stephen, you have done all that I want you to do. You have coughed enough. It's time to come home. Both you and I know that unless there's a miracle, you'll die in the next two or three hours. Could you also believe that that might be the best thing that could happen to you? And there was a very profound silence, and then he looked up and he said, thank you. That helps a lot. I think I can. And he died very peacefully a few hours later. But his amazing mother had not finished with me. Three weeks later, I got a note, which I still have somewhere, which went like this. She said, it was ironic you were not allowed to give Stephen food for his body, but thank God you were there when he needed food for his soul. It turned out he'd been asking that question of his family, his doctor, his priest, and they'd all pushed it away. Now, it wouldn't have made any difference to God's handling of Stephen whether I was there or not. It wasn't really for Stephen. It was very important for his mother that her first child to die of CF die well. But it was really for me. It was a huge guilt trip because I hadn't had a conversation like that for 20 years. Within a week, I heard of another of my children who had died asking that question. Nobody had arrived. 
And I knew, unless someone like me with my seniority started saying this should be done, nothing would happen. So I've been serving penance ever since, and it's been a delightful penance, I must acknowledge. <laughs>